Thanks, Kamal. Uh, this is kind of a d difficult topic, non-neurologic complications and how to avoid them. But I do have some things to, to share with you this morning. Uh, many of them are currently just ongoing issues that I have in my own institution as well as my own uh, state. Uh, these are my um, uh, disclosures, uh, nothing significant. So these are just some of the spinal complications that I thought I would talk about briefly today, and I've certainly scratched out neurologic, but perioperative blood loss at the time of surgery, post-operative infection, medical complications, and I'm not going to say much about implant related because that's more of a technical uh, uh, issue. But there are things to be said about each of these uh, topics. I've been interested in perioperative blood loss for a long time, and we have been using, since 1998 at my institution, we've been using Amacar as a way of decreasing blood loss. But there are a lot of things that we can do uh, to try and minimize it. We're all familiar with the, some of the problems of excessive blood loss, the hemodynamic instability and how that can affect even the survival of the patients, transfusion-related complications. So we have a big interest in avoiding allogeneic blood transfusions, if at all uh, possible. But how do you prevent or minimize perioperative blood loss? And we all know the answer to many of these questions. We have special operative frames and tables now that decrease pressure on the abdomen, which decrease venous pressure. That in turn is equated with less blood loss. We use hypotensive anesthesia. And as I said earlier, we, there are medications available, and we are a big proponent of antifibrinolytic uh, medications. And what's happened in Cleveland is that in, for 1998, for an idiopathic scoliosis, we routinely requested three units of autologous blood. Our blood loss has dropped so dramatically, we now request one unit, but if the family or the child doesn't want to donate that unit of blood, we don't, even, we don't really care, because even when we have autologous blood, only one in three patients get their unit of autologous blood back. We don't change our uh, indications for transfusions based on the fact that they may have autologous blood available to them. We have set criteria, and if we happen to have autologous blood, that's fine. If we don't, then we'll go to allogeneic blood. Uh, Epsilon aminocaproic acid, or Amacar, is probably the most common. It's a medication that's been around for a long time. Uh, it is very inexpensive. The total cost per case is about $5. There's transimic acid, which undoubtedly is a stronger, more powerful anti-fibrinolytic agent, but it's also much more expensive as well. I have no experience with it, but I certainly would use it if, if Amacar is not available. And in fact, one of the issues until this past week in my own institution was there's been an, apparently there's an Amacar shortage nationally. Hopefully some of that's due to the work that we've done in Cleveland, looking at a variety of settings for spinal deformity from idiopathic to neuromuscular to anterior posterior uh, procedures. Uh, but more and more people are using either one or either one of these drugs in order to try and decrease perioperative blood loss. And certainly surgical techniques, the infiltration of vasoconstrictive agents in the wounds and in the uh, paraspinous muscles. Uh, we have been using this new bipolar uh, uh, cautery sealant. Uh, it's called uh, Aquamantis. Uh, one of our residents wanted to look at the results of our first 50 patients, first idiopathic scoliosis patient in which we used Aquamantis. I thought this was going to be no big deal. But when he went back and looked at our use of Aquamantis, and they all had Amacar on board, uh, we had statistically less blood loss and less operative time compared to the previous and the immediate previous 50 patients in which we did not use uh, the Aquamantis. And so it's another way of, of doing things to try and decrease the amount of perioperative blood loss, particularly intraoperative blood loss, uh, that, that could happen at the time of spinal surgery. Certainly we want to do everything we can to promote hemostasis, and technical skills certainly play a role because if you, you need to be fairly facile in doing these procedures. The faster you can do it, the, the less exposure there is, the less blood loss there is. Post-op infection, probably the single biggest topic in my state right now, the state of Ohio. Um, infections are the second most severe post-operative complications uh, following neurological injury. And in idiopathic scoliosis, the literature says one to four percent. I know in my own institution it's less than one percent. 
and compare that to neuromuscular scoliosis, which is much higher, ranging from 4 up to 14 percent. We just published a study looking at post-operative infections in our neuromuscular population, and I'll mention that here in just a moment. This is the Ohio Children's Hospital Collaborative Solutions for Patient Safety, and this is our protocol used by every children's hospital in the state of Ohio. This has been adapted and modified from the cardiothoracic literature, and I think it's being used in many other places throughout uh, North America. I've had one article in my role as the co-editor of the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics. I've had one article from Colorado using virtually the same protocol, although they made it seem like it was unique to their institution. I don't think it was, but that's one of the questions that's been sent uh, back to them. But what we do now to try and minimize our risk for post-operative infections, we do nasal, ax axillary, and groin cultures for a Staph aureus screen that starts about two weeks preoperatively. If we have a positive uh, culture for Staph aureus, our methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, we start intranasal uh, mu mupiracin or Bactroban two days pre-op, and we continue that for three days post-op. If they have negative cultures for staff, we just continue on. There's no treatment necessary for that group of patients. We use chlorhexidine wipes. Now, we do that in the preoperative care area. They get to totally wiped down uh, with this uh, uh, met, uh, cleansing agent. Uh, our preoperative antibiotics are started 30 to 45 minutes prior to skin incision. We redose every three hours during the case and we are still giving antibiotics on a statewide basis for 48 hours post-op, even though a lot of places now recommend only for 24 hours. At the time of skin prep, we use chlor prep with a, with a tent that allows us to see exactly where we have, we have prepped the skin so we don't miss any uh, areas. Pediatric infectious disease tracks any infection that occurs in the spine. Uh, they look at the timing of antibiotics. They look at the use of chlorhexidine and they do a root cause analysis of all the infections that, that we have. Fortunately, since we began this protocol, we've not had any in, in uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. We've had a, one or two in children with neuromuscular uh, uh, disorders. This is our perioperative antibiotic protocol, and it's very unusual, and I don't really understand the entire philosophy, but this is what we have, the state of Ohio has decided will be our protocols. If you are negative MRSA and you have no allergies to medications, you get cefazolin. If you're negative MRSA cultures but you have a penicillin allergy, you get clindamycin uh, at the time of skin incision. You get it at 6 and 12 hours uh, uh, following skin incision. But you're going to get vancomycin at 3 hours, 9 hours, and during the post-operative period, those first uh, 48 hours. If you have clindamycin sensitive MRSA, vanco, uh, pre-op, 6, 12, and post-op, clindamycin is given to 3 and 9. And if you have clindamycin resistant MRSA, you can see here that you're getting vancomycin pre-op, 6 and 12 hours, and post-operatively you get linazolid at 3 hours, and you're going to get daptomycin at 9 hours. So there's really kind of this broad spectrum, kind of multi-purpose uh, antibiotic therapy to, or, to try and minimize the risk for a post-operative uh, infection. This is a study we just published looking at our neuromuscular population. I should mention I have no data on the current protocol that was just started this past year. Um, infections are so low I can't tell you that we've really ma it's made a difference. I'm certainly hoping that it has made a difference, but maybe in the next one to two years we'll have enough information to, uh, to to go back and analyze this group of patients that had this uh, particular protocol. Uh, anyway, this is the wound infections after surgery for neuromuscular scoliosis, and this was done by one of our residents, Dan Masters. Uh, it was just published uh, earlier this year. And we've covered a lot of this already this morning, but certainly uh, contributing factors to post op infection have been varied uh, throughout the literature from neurological involvement, the use of allograft, bone graft, preoperative malnutrition, post-operative UTIs, and increased transfusion requirements have all been felt to be associated with an increasing risk for post-operative infections. So we looked at all of our patients that had neuromuscular scoliosis uh, and had a minimum of two years of follow-up. This came from our pediatric orthopedic spine database. 
uh, which goes to 1992, and we have about 2,000 patients in that database at this point. But 151 of these we had two years of documented follow-up uh, uh, on. Uh, we classified infections by early or late, as you see here, by the time at which the, uh, the infection was clinically evident. And they were classified according to location. Superficial, which meant above the fascia, deep, deep to the fascia, but posterior to the transverse processes, and paraspinals when they were deep or anterior to the transverse processes. Uh, we had eight wound infections uh, for about 5.3%, still within the range of what you would see on previously published uh, studies. We then took nine controls out of the group of 151 patients uh, to compare, um, to, to try and match them and compare them to the eight infections. So we matched our controls by age of surgery, their year of surgery, and the type of surgery they, uh, they underwent to try and determine uh, anything specific that might be associated with the use with uh, with that postoperative infection. Uh, these are the factors we analyzed preoperatively: typical things of age of surgery, ambulatory status, preoperative cob angle, ventricular peritoneal shunts, and we looked at myelodysplasia as a separate entity. Intraoperatively, we looked at the type of surgery, time, uh, graft material, estimated blood loss, transfusion requirements. Postoperatively, we looked at their uh, urinary the incidence of urinary tract infections. So, and this is the operative treatment classification. These are things that uh, were set forth by Paul Sponseller. Type A treatment was a debridement and closure over drains on one or several times. Uh, the wound was never left completely open. Uh, type B is a debridement and delayed closure. B1 was a late direct closure, B2 a rotational flap, and 3 was secondary intention or granulation. And C was debridement, removal of instrumentation, and primary closure. This is a reference to Sponseller's article if you want more information regarding uh, this classification system. It was published in 2000. Well, these are our results. Again, 5.3% uh, or 8 patients. Uh, five were early, three were late, one was superficial, six deep, and one was paraspinal. Uh, we found no significant differences in the infection group and the match control group uh, with respect to the mean age of surgery, preoperative cob angles, number of levels fused, operative time for estimated blood loss, or their transfusion requirements. Uh, these are the organisms, as you can see, Staphyl Staphylococcus aureus, uh, uh, occurred in the majority of the patients. Enterococcus was another gram-positive cause. We had one gram-negative, which was Pseudomonas. This is the type of treatment they all underwent. Uh, we had note uh, only one type uh, A in which they had only antibiotics and primary, just a debridement and closure. And we had three patients that had their implants that removed, and these were the late patients. The risk factors, the factors that we found to be significant was the presence or absence of a ventricular peritoneal shunt. This goes back and, and again really supports the concept of any prior surgery as a risk factor. And unfortunately, we didn't see the same thing in myelodysplasia. Uh, but I think anytime you've had a, a spine that's been operated before, your risk for infection is going to go up. We've seen this uh, time and time again in our patients with early onset scoliosis and from our article that was published this past year in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, the risk for infection increased by around 15% every time you did a, a, a lengthening or revision surgery. So, and if you have infection, what does that mean? Well, it's going to increase your risk for pseudoarthrosis. It's also going to increase your length of hospitalization. Those are fairly common uh, deductions to be made. So any conclusions about our neuromuscular population was the presence of a VP shunt associated with increased risk for infection. Uh, these typically require operative intervention and they are associated with pseudoarthroses and increased length of hospitalizations. Now looking at med medical complications, I'm going to look at these kind of collectively because they do vary a lot with the diagnosis and the overall health of the child. I think it's important we try to identify our high-risk patients. Uh, we want to do a careful preoperative evaluation and treat any potential problems. We want to involve other specialists that may be necessary in the care of that child during the post-operative period. This is an interesting article just published in uh, the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics this past year. It's 
comes from Denver Children's Hospital, but they developed what they call a care pathway for spinal surgery, or CAPS, and this was developed in 1999. And it's an algorithm for preoperative assessment for complex patients undergoing spinal surgery to minimize risk and to enhance overall outcome. And I think this is really key to the management of uh, particularly neuromuscular patients, syndromic patients, those that are potentially less healthy than an idiopathic patient would be. But these are members of the CAPS team, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, obviously, PICU attendings, pulmonologists, nutritionists, physical therapists, assistive technologists, your respiratory therapist, social worker, case manager, and others as necessary. They met and went over these patients beginning two to three months prior to their procedure, so they had adequate time to make their assessment, determine what the patient would need to have done now in order to optimize their health by the time they were having their uh, spinal surgery. And this is what they did. They actually had 1999, they had 23 patients. They had 50 patients, in, and this was prior to the CAPS, and then in 2008 they had 50 patients uh, that had gone through the CAPS uh, procedure. And these were match control patients, so they didn't analyze every single one of them. But I think collectively, the things that are important are listed in, in yellow or gold. You can see the length of stay went down when we had this preoperative assessment and treatment. The PICU length of stay went down. The days of intubation went down from 7.4 to less than one day. Estimated blood loss stayed about the same, maybe even a little bit higher. This is probably associated with more complex uh, surgical procedures that we have available to us today. Complications went down from 2.4 per patient to 0 0.3. So I think if you want to look at a way of trying to minimize your risk for medical complications postoperatively, you need to be thinking about trying to have preoperative assessments well in advance of your surgical procedure. So I'll leave you with these conclusions regarding non-neurological complications. Many are avoidable, or at least the incidence and severity can be reduced. Careful preoperative evaluation and treatment, development of preoperative and postoperative protocols that you can follow, similar to what we're doing in Ohio right now to try and minimize our risk for having postoperative infections, I like to think of minimizing perioperative blood loss decreases our complication rate and makes the child's post-operative period easier. We try to avoid excessive traffic through the operating room so we have less air disturbance, we have less uh, people uh, bringing things in and out of the uh, room, and again, efficient uh, uh, surgery. So if you think about these things, and maybe implement these in your own institution, hopefully you can decrease your incidence of non-neurological complications and in a wide range of patients undergoing spinal surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Uh